Thank you all. Did a good job for you. <laughs> so if you guys would please join me in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this morning. Thank you that your presence is here. We ask that, Father, you would work through your Holy Spirit, that you would open our eyes to truth that needs to be seen, our hearts, that we would be receptive to you and your word. Father, have your way. We ask that we would be pleasing before you in the way in which we approach your word, you know, that, Lord, you would uh, be glorified if you're in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As a child growing up, I very much looked forward to going to parades on the 4th of July. Memorial Day, we would pile in the car. My dad and my uncle next door, there were eight kids between the two houses, and we would make our way down to Euclid Avenue in downtown Willoughby. We would find a really good spot, and the kids would all line up on the curb, anticipating with tremendous excitement the arrival of the parade seemed like an eternity that we waited, but then you would start to hear people clapping and cheering and hear the different groups would come. The American Legion, you'd see the local high school band, of course the fire trucks and the police cars. It was an exciting time and as a little guy, of course, the favorite part was the candy throwing. We'd be diving all over the, the road picking up those pieces of candy and then go home and celebrate the holiday together as a large family. In our text this morning, and we begin a, a very short series during the Passion Week, we begin today, we'll have Good Friday service at 6 o'clock, so if you'd like to, we'd love to have you join us. We'll be doing communion that evening and then culminating our time together next Sunday, Easter Sunday. Our series is entitled, The Impact of Jesus the Messiah. And the truth of the matter is, ever since Jesus arrived on the scene, he has caused quite, quite the stir. He has made an impact. And so this morning we kick off this series, and I'm glad that you're with us to do that. But our passage this morning is a very familiar text. If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. And we really have an account of a parade that took place. I, uh, it's interesting as you read the text, there's really two different parades that are happening simultaneously. The first is a parade in which people are seeking a God that they want. The second parade that is happening simultaneously is a parade that portrays a God that every single person truly needs. And so you have this tension, this tension that exists, the, the God that people want and the God that ultimately people need. This is Palm Sunday, historically a day set aside where across the board it's recognized that Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. People cheered as he came. Of course, it will culminate next week as we celebrate on Easter Sunday. If you guys have turned to your copy of God's Word, chapter 21 of Matthew, I'd like to read the text in its entirety, verses 1 through 11, and then we're going to go back and look at these two different parades, a parade that really portrayed a, a God people wanted versus the second parade, a God that people desperately needed. Verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, her colt, by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what the was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went 
and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. A very familiar text. If you grew up in the church, you probably heard this just about every Palm Sunday. And I'd like for us to look together this morning in our time at these two different parades that were going on at the same time. The first was a parade that people were rejoicing and celebrating a God they wanted. The second was a parade that Jesus was walking. So let's begin this morning by looking at this first parade. This God parade that people wanted. And as you read the text, and as you listen here, as we talk a little bit about the text this morning, we see that there were people in front of Jesus and people behind Jesus. They were shouting, praising him. They were laying their coats down on the road before him. They were laying palm branches down on the road as well. And it would seem, as you read through this text, that there was every indication that these people knew exactly and understood exactly who Jesus was. In fact, they called out to him, Hosanna. Hosanna to God in the highest, or in the highest. The word Hosanna literally means God save us. And so you would have the sense that they understood the mission of Jesus Christ. We're also told that they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Now this would have been an Old Testament reference or title that points to a messianic expectation. As Jesus rode on this cult, we're told that the people then placed their cloaks, their coats on the, on the road. They laid these branches on the road. This was something that symbolized that they viewed him as royal. And so they viewed Jesus as something, something in the form of some kind of a king. And then we're told that as Jesus goes through the outer gate into the city of Jerusalem, that the people in the city, in fact, it says the whole city was stirred. This comes from the Greek word seismos. We get our English word seismograph, seismologist. The instrument used to measure the seismic waves when an earthquake hits. And so you get the idea that as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem and as these people are praising him, and as they are laying their coats and, and palm branches on the ground before him, they're stirred, they're, they're shaken. And they ask a very legitimate question. Who is this? And we find the answer given to us in the very next verse, verse 11. The crowds answer, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They didn't say a prophet. Their answer was a good answer. The prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so again, you'd stop and you'd say it would appear that these guys understand who Jesus is. The term prophet here in reference to the prophet points us back to several different Old Testament texts. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 God promised his people that he would send someone, a prophet. And this prophet would be one who would come, and his whole reason for coming was to rescue his people and to speak the word of God to the people. And so again, it would seem as though this crowd of people in Jerusalem understood exactly 
who Jesus was, right? Not at all. Not at all. The crowd, in fact, really misunderstood who Jesus was. And there are some points of reference that I think help validate the fact that they misunderstood him. They did not in any way, shape, or form really understand what was going on. We can find that as we go to another account in the Gospel of Luke on the same particular passage of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. And in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 42, Luke writes... As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. You talk about raining on the parade. Why was he weeping? These people are cheering for him. They're shouting Hosanna in the highest. And it says that Jesus, as he's crying, he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus wept, and he wept specifically because he could see how spiritually blinded the people were. They didn't know who he was. But then Matthew, interesting enough, right before we get to the chapter 21 that we've read here together, he gives us another account of an incident that happened as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho. Kind of like a mini parade. They're passing by and there are two blind men who are seated there. In fact, let me read verses 29 through 34 in chapter 20 of Matthew. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and he called to them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. And Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and followed him. The text here you can kind of envision Jesus and his disciples leaving Jericho. There's this crowd of people, but then there's two blind guys. Physically blind, but yet they knew there was something different about this one called Jesus. They knew that he was not just a man. They knew he was not just a prophet. They knew that there was more to him than that. That he was more than capable of restoring their sight. And so we see an incredible demonstration of faith on the part of these two blind men. An incredible demonstration of their belief that Jesus, Jesus could help them. Two physically blind men who received their sight because of their faith and belief in Jesus. Happens right before we get to our account of the triumphal entry in chapter 21. Where there's a large crowd of people who physically have their sight, but who spiritually are completely blinded to the fact that the very one before them, on a donkey, on a colt specifically, was not just a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. He's the one that was promised, the Messiah who came to truly help them and provide for them what they so desperately needed. It's interesting. We also see the reality of this crowd really not having a clue as to what was going on and who this person was because this very same crowd that was cheering for Jesus on this particular day in less than a week were some of the very same people that turned him over to be crucified and were yelling those words, crucify him. They were a people on this particular day who were cheering for the king that they wanted to come, who they hoped would establish his earthly kingdom here on earth, would overthrow the power in Rome. But instead, they neglected to understand that Jesus wasn't coming to set up an earthly reign, an earthly kingdom. He was coming 
to set up a heavenly kingdom and his heavenly throne. They were cheering and applauding for one they hoped would be a liberator from those who oppressed them in Rome. But Jesus had come not to overthrow the oppressors in Rome, but to give his life as a sacrifice, to die on the cross of Calvary, to defeat and rescue man from sin and Satan and death. You see, the reality is, as this parade is taking place, the crowd had a much different agenda than the agenda that Jesus had. God did not send the Jesus the people wanted. God sent the Jesus that man desperately needs. And I'd like to take the remainder of our time this morning to look at this Jesus that we all need. There are several things that we see in our text this morning. First, God sent the Jesus we need, and the Jesus we need is one who we see as sovereign over all creation. He's sovereign over all creation. And so you can imagine as Jesus is making his way from the Mount of Olives heading toward Jerusalem, he instructs two of his disciples, the scripture tells us. He said, listen, I want you to go into the village. You're going to go into the village and there you're going to find a donkey and you're going to find her colt. You're going to be tied up. Just untie them and bring them to me. Oh, oh, and if anyone asks, just tell them the Lord needs them. In the Old West, if you stole somebody's horse, you'd be hung. But this isn't just anybody. This is the first account we read in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus referred to himself as Lord. Just tell them the Lord needs them and they'll give them right to you. The very words of Jesus, the instructions he gave his two disciples are words of authority, words of sovereignty. He can do that, you see, because he is truly, truly Lord. He is truly the master over all, including livestock. And so we see the sovereignty of God over all creation. And once the disciples come back and have with them these two animals, the donkey and her colt, notice which of the two Jesus rode on. He didn't ride on the broken donkey, a donkey that was accustomed to and used to somebody riding on it. No, he chose the unbroken colt. I don't know how many of you ride horses. My parents have a farm and my younger brother lives there and he has a number of horses. I can tell you this, even a horse that has been broken, if it hadn't been ridden for a while, if you go to get on it, have fun. You will have a ride. I did it not too long ago. <laughs> the horse Jake, we started off really well. But Jake obviously was tired of people riding him. And he made it known. I'm done. So I had my own little rodeo, you might say. <laughs> Jesus rode on the colt, the unbroken colt. And he did so for very good reason. We'll get to that in just a moment. But he is the Lord of all creation. He is the master, and this is proof of that very thing as he rode on the back of that colt into Jerusalem. It's interesting. Now, Jesus, even in his death, was totally in control. In John's Gospel, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Jesus knows fully well what lies ahead. Even in his death, he makes it abundantly clear in this text. No one's going to take my life from me. I choose to lay my life down. 
I'm going to choose the day that I lay my life down. I'm going to choose the time that I give my life up. I'm going to choose the people who will drive the nails in my hands. But please know, Jesus not only creates all, Jesus is in control of all things. He holds all things in his hand. But as I say that, I know that many of us in the room will say, I agree with that. That is the Jesus I need. The one who is sovereign over all. But if we're truly honest in our heart of hearts, we'd also have to come to terms with the fact that there are times in our lives when while I know that he is desiring to be in control of all areas of my life, we don't always give him control of all. There are times we say, okay, Lord, you can have this, but I'm going to hang on to this other piece. I don't want you messing around in my marriage. I'm a good parent. I can handle my kids on my own. Please don't mess around with my work. But God's desire is for you and I not only to know that he's sovereign of all, but that we allow him to truly be the Lord of all in our lives. When I understand that he is sovereign over all creation, when I truly understand that, then I can come to terms with the fact that God knows what is best for me. That God has the ability to bring about what is best for me in my life. That he is, in fact, sovereign over all the universe. And that he will, in fact, do what is best for you and for me. But it requires that you and I be willing to surrender it all. Can I just throw out there? When we finally come to terms with that, we just kind of open our hand and say, Lord, you have it all. All of it. I'm not worried because I know that you will do what's best. Life does, in fact, go better. I'm not promoting that life is pain-free. That's not what I'm saying. But when God is in control of everything in my life, things go better. When I surrender my marriage to the Lord, my marriage goes better. Don't believe me? Don't surrender it to the Lord and look and see how it plays out. When I surrender my family to the Lord, family life goes better. When I surrender my finances to the Lord, it goes better. When I surrender my suffering to the Lord, it goes better. When I'm willing to surrender my future to the Lord, life goes better because I know he cares about my future more than I. When I take the circumstances I'm dealing with in life and I surrender them before the Lord, it goes better. And on and on it goes. God's saying, I want to be truly the Lord of your life. I want you to understand that the God that has been sent to us is one who is in control of all. He is sovereign over all creation. But there's a second thing we need to understand about this God that we all desperately need, and that's this. The Jesus we need is the guarantee of God's promises. He's the guarantee of God's promises. When Jesus came riding towards Jerusalem on the back of a colt, we need to understand that his reason for doing that was a very good one. He was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It's quoted there for us in verse 5. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. Jesus was filling that Old Testament prophecy. He came, in fact, as the Messiah, riding on this colt. But there's a second prophecy that he was fulfilling on this particular day. One you're not going to necessarily see here, but one that is definitely worth stopping and taking in. It's found in the book of Daniel. 
And Daniel is a letter written to the people of Israel, written to a people who had been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. These were a people who, as they're being taken from their own town, their own city, and moved to Babylon. The walls of Jerusalem broken down, the temple broken. These were people who have been deported to Babylon and they are devastated. They're absolutely devastated. And God speaks to them. He provides for his people in captivity hope. People who desperately needed hope. And that's exactly what God speaks of here. He lets them know you're not going to be in Babylon forever. There's going to come a day when you're going to be given the opportunity to return to Jerusalem. You're going to be given the opportunity to rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple. That day is coming. And he shares that he's going to send one. He's going to bring a Messiah to them. A Messiah who ultimately is coming. To rescue his people from their oppressors. And we read this verse tucked away in Daniel 9, verse 25. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. <coughs> Clear as mud, huh? What God is saying to the people of Jerusalem, his chosen people, is this. There's going to come a time when you, in fact, will be able to return. You'll be able to rebuild the wall in the temple. And this is what he tells them in this verse. From the time that the decree is issued for you to be able to return back home, until the time the Messiah comes. Tells us there's going to be seven sevens and 62 sevens. If you read commentaries, most theologians will tell you that they take those sevens to represent seven years each. So you have seven sevens, 49 years, and 62 sevens, which if you do the math, it's 434 years. We add those together and we come up with 483 year period of time. And if you go back and you realize that as you read Ezra and then go into Nehemiah that uh, Cyrus of Persia, the king of Persia, gave a decree in chapter 1 of Ezra, letting and allowing the Jews to return back and to rebuild the wall. And then if we move forward in time to the time that Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Guess how many years went by? 483 years. Some have even traced it to the exact day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey. So not only did Jesus ride in on a donkey to fulfill the prophecy in Zechariah, but he arrived on year 483 in fulfillment of the prophecy in the book of Daniel. Why is that so important? Well, I think there's an incredibly good reason, fantastic reason, and that's this. That fulfillment of prophecy is proof that God follows through on his promises. The fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy is proof that God is faithful that he will fulfill his promises. We need to understand that he is purposeful, that he is faithful, and that he is one who is powerful to complete the promises that he shares with us in his word. And church, we need to know that the promises he makes to you and I, he will be good on as well. We need to understand in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul writes and he says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken to us, to the glory of God. 
So we look at promises in the New Testament. I'm not going to exhaust them, but let me share just a few. We need to understand that the promises we read, we can believe. And God will deliver on it. If you don't believe me, you look at his son, Jesus Christ. He tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. You can count on that. He tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. You can count on that. He tells us that if you seek him, you will find him. You can count on that. That he works all things together for our good. Romans 8, 28. That he'll meet your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He tells us, you draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Do you believe those promises, church? Look at his son, Jesus. You can bank on it. So Jesus is a one who came because we desperately need him. He is one who is sovereign over all creation. He is one who is a guarantee of all of God's promises. And then thirdly and lastly, Jesus, the Jesus we need, is a suffering servant. We're going to talk more about that on Good Friday. But let me just share a little bit in our time together this morning. When you think of a suffering servant, that's not the Jesus the Jews were wanting on that particular day as he rode on the back of that colt into Jerusalem. But without a doubt, he was exactly the Jesus they needed. For that matter, he's the Jesus you and I need too. Remember, he rode on a colt. For a ruler, to ride on a horse meant warfare. But when a king would ride into a town on the back of a donkey, it meant two things. It meant, one, that he was coming to serve his people. And secondly, he was coming at a time of peace. <coughs> Came to serve and to provide peace. And so here we have this account of Jesus' triumphal entry, riding on the back of a colt. He came, he came as a servant, and he came to establish peace. Now the truth of the matter is when you think of a king and you think of peace, peace usually came about as a result of war and bloodshed. It would come, peace would come at the price of bloodshed. But it wasn't because of war. It was the very blood of Jesus Christ that would be sacrificed and poured out to provide for you and me the peace we so desperately need, spiritually speaking. That's the Jesus that you and I desperately need. The Bible is very clear that every single one of us since the time of Adam and sin entered into the world is a sinner. Every one of us. The Bible tells us in Hebrews verse, uh, chapters 8 and 9 that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. And so here we are. We're in a bad spot. We are all people who have a sin debt we can't pay. The sin debt needed to be paid to satisfy the very wrath of God. It required a perfect, perfect sacrifice. Jesus met those requirements. But it also required a human body with blood in it that would be shed in order to pay the price for the sins of man. That's why Jesus came in the form of humanity, ultimately knowing fully well that he was going to go to a cross and there he would die for your sins and mine. So peace was made available through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And God saw the condition you were all and I were all in. He knew there was nothing we could do about it. So he willingly sent his son Jesus Christ as the perfect God man came to earth, lived the life while he was here perfectly. And then he willingly became a servant, went to a cross where he was crucified, where he was broken, where he was bloodied, and ultimately where he died. Why? So that you and I could experience peace with God. Paul said it well in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. He said, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I grew up on hymns. Jerry plays a piano and she'll pull out a hymn book and she'll play and we'll sing together sometimes. There's a great old hymn penned by Charles Wesley who lived from 1707 to 1788. And the song's entitled, And Can It Be That I Should Gain? Let me just read the words to you. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused him pain, for me who him to death pursued. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite. His grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. No condemnation now I dread. I am my Lord's and he is mine. Alive in him, my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? I'm going to ask if you would just bow your heads for a moment and close your eyes. Maybe you're here this morning. You've heard this passage spoken from before. But maybe it's never really penetrated your heart. The reality that Jesus is coming was because he came due to the fact that you desperately need him. That he, while being cheered for and praised seemingly so on that Palm Sunday, would just in a matter of days be nailed to the cross of Calvary and his blood poured out for your sins and mine. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You recognize your sin. You recognize your need for him. And maybe today is the day you say, I want to know Jesus Christ. I, I surrender my life before him. And I know that my sins were paid for on the cross of Calvary in full by the very precious blood of my Savior now, Jesus Christ. By faith, I ask him to become the Lord of my life. That's true of you this morning. You've never trusted him before, but desire to do so today. Would you just slip up your hand and then put it down? Today, by faith, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Anyone? Father, we come to you this morning so thankful that you didn't come as the God we wanted. You didn't come as a God, sometimes that we want you to be, who is a hands-off God, only in our time of desperate need do we call out for you. That we, you didn't come as that genie in the bottle that we rub and you grant us every wish we ever want. No, you came. You came as the God we desperately need. The one who is sovereign over all creation. thank you that you are. I thank you that you came as the one who guarantees the promises of God.
Lord, thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you for entering into our world as crazy and chaotic as it was, as it is. And you paid the ultimate price so that we could have a right relationship with you and experience true peace, spiritually speaking. Lord, thank you for being that suffering servant who did for us what we could never, ever have accomplished apart from you. Your love, we can't deny. Your love, none of us deserve. But because of your incredible grace for us, we can experience the joy of knowing you as Lord and Savior. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.